Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're on lesson number five right now, dealing with debt. Ooh. All about managing for the master. This is a whole quarter's lesson on stewardship and yes. financial care and whatnot. And, um, and when it came to dealing with debt, just as I reviewed the lesson, I think you were too, I think the simple takeaway is it's not necessarily it's good. Not good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we'll probably dive a little bit deeper than that. Uh, yeah. But there was a, a special statement we need to cover, right? There was. So the, the uh, General Conference released a disclaimer on this particular lesson. <laughs> probably makes sense. As, uh, that goes like this. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice. But is, generally, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation. Mm. So Fair enough. I think you probably have to do the same thing if it was about diet and lifestyle kind yeah. of things, like consult your physician if you're, you know, whatever. So I think that makes sense. Well, you're talking about <laughs> principles of giving, tithing principles, and mm -hmm. somebody could say, well, I'm suing the church because I started giving 10% of my income to the church and now my family's in, which yeah. Well, let's not, not give many happen, ideas, but, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, um, but. It doesn't matter <laughs> if they have ideas because there's been a disclaimer now. Exactly, and let's be clear, what we're talking about here is not, the word used twice there was advice, yes. but it is counsel, it is based on biblical principle and things to consider. So we still got lots Put to talk about. Put that old thinking cap on kids <laughs> as we're going through this Amen. and I think there's just practical, self-evident almost um, counsel that we find in scripture for how to deal with, well, in this particular week, how to, uh, what I, what I, how I described it is this week's lesson focuses on personal debt and how to manage it. Okay. So maybe we should have a word of prayer yep. and then I'll talk about the talking points this week and we'll get into it. Let's do it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the principles of your word, that your word isn't just theory, but it's practical in our lives. And Lord, we want to see what it's like to live the biblical lifestyle, even in the management of our finances. So please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to bless us today as we discuss these topics, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I may want to uh, just bring up briefly, if you're just joining us in Talking Points, you haven't seen this before, Talking Points is a weekly program that reviews the uh, Sabbath School the Quarterly... Seventh-day Adventist Bible Study well, I Guide. I was just going to call it the Quarterly okay. because it's easier. But yes, the Adult Bible Study Guide, which I was going to describe as, for our viewers, if you are or are not a Seventh-day Adventist, but you're joining with us, um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, each quarter of the year, puts together a study guide on the Bible, either a topic of the Bible or a theme in the Bible or, or a book of the, of the Bible, Bible yep. or what have you. And so this quarter's lesson has to do with the Bible's financial principles. And mm -hmm. so that's what we've been going over. We're glad you're joining us. And our lesson this week is dealing with debt, as we said. Okay. Um, typically in a Talking Points lesson, we are trying to draw out some points from the lesson, especially for the help of local teachers to give them an idea of how mm -hmm. they may highlight that particular lesson. We've drawn three Talking Points this week. The first Talking Point, Cameron, from our study this week is that the borrower is slave to the lender, mm. and that is almost our memory verse. In fact, it would be our memory verse if taken from the NIV translation. Okay. The borrower is slave to the lender, talking point number one. Now, talking point number two is that debt may sometimes be necessary. Mm. Despite the, you know, debt is bad and what have you kind of connotations, debt is sometimes necessary. Somehow can necessary. be bad and also necessary. And okay. that is clear from Scripture. And then finally... You can be free from debt. Amen. <laughs> and we'll elaborate on that as we go on. That's our third talking point. Okay, so let's go back to number one. Oh, I should have oh. said, um, talking point number one is drawn primarily from Sabbath, Sunday, and Monday's outline. Uh, talking point number two from Wednesday and Thursday. Talking point number three from Tuesday's lessons. And also um, Fridays a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. And a little bit on Friday, yes. Okay, so talking point number one. The borrower is slave to the lender. What a strong statement. Yes. Uh, it, what, but what does that mean? Let's unpack it a little bit. Well, and I put it in the outline, when a person owes, he or she is obligated to pay that debt off. Mm -hmm. And as long as you do, now we don't have this today, but there used to be something called a debtor's prison. You can look this up where, where in, I don't know, there may be countries that still practice this, be it few. But it's not just between. a Bible times concept. I mean, right. in more recent years, yeah. When you, so you owe, I mean, look, we still have certain things where if you owe money, you, your wages can be garnished. Mm -hmm. So, but with the debtor's prison, if you owed money 
and you didn't pay it back, you could be thrown into prison. And you think of a, of a time when primarily the father worked and the mother stayed and raised the kids. Mm -hmm. um, if he ends up in prison. He's got no income. And she's got no, no the family has no and way I've to pay it off. And I've never quite understood this. Like, I'm going to sit here and lock you in a cell so you can pay it back. It's like, well, how am I going to get income? And it seems to be a spiral. Well, I think <laughs> in the debtor's prison, you could earn money by certain tasks and what have you. Okay. And, but the point is... That misery. when you owe money, you're obligated to that until you pay that off. Mm -hmm. And in certain situations, that obligation is a lot more uh, of a burden than in others. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible's just counseling against that. When you owe, like the borrowers, just it's it's not saying never to borrow, as we're going to see. It's almost like you remember when Paul went to Jerusalem. I've had people say, God told through the prophet Agabus, told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. No, he didn't. He just told him what was going to happen there. Remember, mm. he said, the man who wears this belt is going to be bound this way in Jerusalem. It's like, the spirit told him not to go, and Paul defied the spirit. No, the spirit just said, I just want you to know I was waiting for you there. And I almost get I <laughs> that. Almost that get could that. be an open conversation. I, like it could be, but I almost want to get this, well, the Lord tells people what lies ahead. And, mm -hmm. I, and almost like the Lord saying, look, as long as you are in a position where you have to borrow you're the servant of the whoever you borrowed from until that's paid off. So mm. that principle kind of you'll see throughout this week's lesson. Um, so God's ultimate intention is that his people would not be borrowers but lenders. We find that in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In fact, if you look up Deuteronomy 28 verse 12, sure, I'll I'll do it. I pulled it. I actually just remembered I looked it up to begin with. Okay. Um, I was saying, I've got it real quick. Oh, okay. Well, do it, Cameron. Look, at, look how quick that was. All right. That was fantastic. It says here. The Lord, I'm so impressed. <laughs> thank you. Let's take time for that. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in, season, in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Now, this is a, this is a longer passage. The Lord talks about how he's going to bless his people as they seek to follow his principles. But there in the end, he makes this point that you can lend. I'm going to bless you. You're going to have an abundance, but you shouldn't borrow. And the idea of him, his counsel against the borrowing is based on this principle. Once you borrow, you're indebted to these. Uh, and, and then when you think for, of Israel being indebted to a nation that doesn't fear God, the position that's going to put them in and mm. what have you, the Lord, it was not his intention that his people would need to yeah. borrow. But it also kind of goes back to a point I think you're probably going to reiterate later about how debt itself is not sinful that's in right. the sense that why would he encourage them to be lenders just to avoid being a borrower? You know, it's the structure is not bad. It's just you don't want to be on the underside of it. That's right. And we'll see more of that as we go. Now, the lesson brings out on Monday three primary causes, I'm um, sorry, Sunday's lesson, three primary causes of debt. And those three causes are, number one, ignorance. That That's just... A person doesn't realize, and we were joking about this a little bit before, but how uh, sometimes, you know, you say, oh, I got this little piece of plastic and I'll take it into a store and I'll show it to the people yeah, and they can just turn give into me a big stuff, screen TV. Right? Look at that. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you've got to pay that off. And some people just don't. I mean, you'd think it would be obvious, but some people just don't realize well, they how not, fast. Yeah, and they might not think along financial terms. They might have grown up in a house where no one else mm -hmm. talked about it. They didn't discuss budgets. They didn't have a you know a, a system in place. And so they come out into a world that's completely monetized, and they have no that's context. Right. So. Well, and you think about the whole credit. Like, basically, uh, I, I remember my first credit card. I remember not being able to get a credit card. I don't know that you could, that even happens now, but I remember telling... Um, uh, one of the one of my su supervisors at work, I was talking. He was actually the financial officer, and he's like, "Look, once that once you get one, you they'll, they're, you're going to get tired of all the people sending you this, that, and the mm, other." The thing is, when you get that first credit card, and it's like, I, "I can I can charge all this stuff, have all this stuff, and pay the minimum payment. Mm. Like it's only going to cost me like twenty dollars a month. Yeah. That twenty dollars a month is never. It's just yeah. going to keep building, building, building. For the next thirty building. years, yeah. So some people there's ignorance. They don't understand yeah. how the whole idea of credit works. And then the second reason it gave was greed. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to greed. And then the last is personal misfortune. Somebody yeah. falls into a situation where I'm out of, out of a job and my family needs this, that, or the other. Some and I have injury, no other way tragedy, that I can think some of. act of nature, whatever, yeah. Right. And so I think that, you know, ignorance can be educated. Personal misfortune is um, something that can't really be controlled so much. But it can be abated, uh, or at least a bit by 
you know, friends, family, the church That's family, right. you know, so there are structures that can help out with that. But greed is the thing that we have the most control over mm -hmm. and the thing that probably gets us into the most trouble. Like mm -hmm. I, I want it now. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. I remember my grandmother used to tell me, I don't understand this generation. She says, when we used to want something, we would save up the money until we had it. And then we would go out and it'd be a big event. We'd go out and buy it. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea of buying on credit was just not like you would wait. And now to wait sounds ridiculous yeah. for many people. And so because we are not, we're, because we're greedy. I mean, greed is a kind of a strong word, but that's, is, is that not what it is? Uh, yeah, when I can't it's wait hard to call to it something else, yeah. And so... Um, the lesson brings out 1 Timothy 6.10, and why don't you read that for us? This is a, I think it's important to read this verse. Okay. Now I was able to get not ahead on the other one because I was over. already in Deuteronomy, but I have to actually go to 1 Timothy, but I can do that. That's okay, Cameron. I had confidence in you. I knew I you could do this. I appreciate that. Chapter 6, verse 10 mm -hmm. says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay, so it's, drawing, it, it's interesting. I think most people have heard the phrase, money is the root of all evil, mm -hmm. which is not what the Bible says. Right, the love of money. <laughs> the it's love the of money. So it's that it, greed, and it, it says in the context, it's, greediness. it's yeah. the greediness. So it's not a sin to have things or to have money to buy things. Well, and that's also, I've always been curious about that because you think of like, you know, Abraham, Though he didn't own land, he was a very wealthy man, you know, yeah. and, and the Lord had blessed and the e Egyptians, whenever they plundered, One of the reasons he was wealthy is he wasn't greedy. Exactly. And so, <laughs> but, but the idea <laughs> of having a lot of money is not antithetical to mm -hmm. Christian character, That's but right. are you driven by that? Are you greedy for but it? But it could you be. And, and it. it's interesting here how some were, were led astray because they had mm -hmm. this... This, they, they begin to idolize their riches. Mm -hmm. And so the Bible repeatedly speaks against greed. In fact, um, Proverbs 4, verses 6 through 8. Let me pull that one up. Um, there are some great passages in the lesson, and I'm not taking time to look at all of them, but Proverbs 4, verse 6 says, Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom, and speaking about wisdom here, is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all your getting, get understanding. Mm. Um, and I'm looking at this, and I'm still thinking, what, this is a great verse, but this is not the one that I thought <laughs> I was going to read. So, perhaps it's, no, um, I don't see where the verse is, so I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 6. Okay. And until I may... In fact, why don't you look at 1 Timothy? Yeah, you were just there. I you can do it again. Over to here. 1 and, Timothy uh, 6 again. Yeah, and I was just in that Proverbs. But yes, 1 Timothy 6, same idea is conveyed here that I was wanting to get out there when it, you're dealing with well, this is the Well, this is the pre-context because I just read verse yes. 10, but in 9 it says, But those who desire to be rich fall in temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And then he goes on to say, That's for the right. love of money is root of all kinds of evil. So, um, there, again, it's not strong counsel against money, but definitely the, the hoarding of it and the treasuring of it, the idolization of it, the greediness of it. Sure. It can be, you know, basically fatal to your character. And I've discovered my faux pas, which I do this often, I needed to go to Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, instead of Proverbs, written by <laughs> Solomon. It was Ecclesiastes 4, verses 6 through 8. The Bible says, better a handful with quietness mm. than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Then I returned, and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? There, this also is vanity and a grave misfortune. So here's a situation where a person is just, greed has consumed their lives. They're mm -hmm. always grasping. They're not happy with what they have. Always grasping for more. So now there's neither son nor brother. The person's alone. Evidently, it, it, it would appear yeah. that it's from the fact that they've just been always so focused, so focused on getting money that they've lost the joy out of their life and they never stop to ask themselves, why am I doing this? Who am I doing it for? I got no... Right. Well, and in, in counter to that, 
not only does the Bible rail against greediness and all the problems it could have, right. but it also uh, uplifts contentment. The That's idea right. of like, because what would be the opposite of greed? It's not just like abject poverty. It's like, right. no, because the Bible is not saying you're either going to be rich and, and sinful or poor and, and holy. No, but there's an idea of contentment, like that's right. Being, being okay with what you have, allowing the Lord to bless, wisely managing what he's given right. you. And your simple principles can make a much better life. Well, it's interesting also that when the Apostle Paul talks about contentment in one place, he says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Mm -hmm. I've learned to be content in all things. So contentment isn't just like, look, you're in abject poverty, but be happy about it. Exactly. It's like there are times when I've had plenty yeah. and I'm content. And then when I didn't have as much, I'm still content. So... Uh, we talked about this before. There's n there's nothing wrong with, you know, n wanting to have something nice, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as long as you're not starting to covet it and, right. and uh, idolize whatever else. But the idea of contentment is, despite what I may not have or where I'm aspiring to, I'm happy where I am. Right. And if I stay where I am, I'm happy. And and maybe in the bigger scheme of things, that I trust the Lord that the Lord is providing what I need when I need it, and if this is where I need to be now, then mm. so be it. Yeah, there's a calmness and peace. Kind of a trusting the in the Christian Lord, or, with, right. which we find this consistently through, as we're talking about finances, there's really a lot of it that has to do with simply trusting the Lord. So yeah, the Bible urges us to be content rather than greedy. God promises to us to provide for our needs right. as we put our trust in Him. Which is where the you know the the Sermon on the Mount counsel from Jesus comes to like they seek right. first the kingdom of God That's and right. all these things. So he's not opposed to all these things, but get your priorities straight. Be content in the Lord, trust in His leadership, and allow these things to come in their time and place as you apply the principles. Right. So so the the main gist to take away there in point one is as we roll into point number two, debt may sometimes be necessary. Don't get into debt over every little thing. Mm. Sometimes you just need to be content and patient and save up money and what have you. But, talking point number two, debt may sometimes be necessary. Now, if we go to Deuter Deuteronomy 15, mm -hmm. the Bible talks about how in the Israelite economy, a person who owed money was relieved from that debt after seven years. Mm -hmm. And so from the, from the standpoint of a borrower, I would imagine most of our viewers have borrowed at some point. Woohoo! You know, the debt, in fact, I've heard a lot of that. You know, student loan debt's going to be canceled, not all kinds of celebrating. And you know, I a don't fun know where thing, that's going to go. But a fun thing might be in a, in a Sabbath school class, if I were leading out one of these, I'd be tempted. Like, you can take the Ten Commandments and say, all right, let's put on our thinking caps now and imagine a world where we actually kept the Ten Commandments. What would it look like? What impacts would it have on society? Well, think about this the seven year lending thing. What can we infer from that? As we've already pointed out, Clearly, the Lord has no problem with lending. He wanted mm -hmm. them to be lenders. But what would the impact on a borrower and a lender be yeah. in this context? Well, you would probably make different structures of debts, different arrangements, even if you are the lender. Because like you were mentioning, why would you take on a mm -hmm. massive load of debt as a creditor? Why would you give it out right. if you know you're never going to get it back and it's be canceled in seven well, that's years? That's where I was yeah. going. Is okay. this the woohoo on the one hand, but right. I hadn't gotten to the point of when you're the lender... And let's say you lend, or in the case, you may be lending or you may give something on credit. Like, here's a problem. I'm going to give you $10,000 worth of something and you've got seven years to pay, you've got whatever to pay it off. Yeah. Um, if in seven years, for example, you'd only paid down $3,000, guess what? I'm out $7,000. Right. So from a lender standpoint in this economy, it wasn't just like nobody paid their debts off. It was more like lenders gave you seven-year terms because right. beyond that, they weren't going to get paid off. So you have a tighter time window and you probably have a lower overhead of what you're willing to lend mm -hmm. out. So from the lender, from the borrower perspective, you're like, woohoo, I'm free. But also you couldn't get the big advances you could because the That's guys right. are more protective. So it, it kind of confined the debt uh, yes. parameters in, in a very helpful way. So mm -hmm. one of the things, uh, a primary takeaway is th if the Lord gave debt parameters that he must have known that debt was going to be a thing. A and it was a legitimate thing. It wasn't mm. a, like you said, debt is not a sin. There are times when debt may be necessary. Mm. Um, at the same time, the principles presented for establishing reasonable term limits. Now, the seven-year term, and I've heard some Christians say, hey, everything should be seven years. We shouldn't borrow longer than seven years. Um, I think when you can do that, great, more power to you. The shorter term you can have on borrowing, you reduce your interest that you pay and all these things. But there are some debts where seven years may not be practical. Well, especially in this day and age, the yeah. world is 
more debt comfortable and yes. debt almost built for debt. Uh, you think of mass, the larger, even even well, their the principal lessening. contributor, right. um, Ed Reed, had talked in in previous books and seminars and things about how, in his youth, like even buying a home, a five year was a normal term of yes. a loan, and now it would be almost unthinkable in five years. You know, fifteen years is well, a small. Well, he brought one. that out in the lesson that it may be that the current prices reflect the ability to get debt. It's like, That's hey, right. if they can. If, if people can finance this, I mean, I remember car loans, the longest term used to be five years, and then it was six years, and then it was seven years, and mm -hmm. I don't know what they're up to now. But right. then the automakers are like, well, I can charge more because now people can afford it because they can stretch they it, it out. out over. That's right. Um, the same thing with higher, edu cycle. higher education, mm -hmm. automobiles, uh, real estate and housing, these kind of things, as they balloon, That's right. the prices go up, and now we're stuck in this cycle where you almost have to have debt because it's the prices are so egregiously high, you couldn't afford any other That's way right. to do it. So those examples you gave, and I put it in the lesson this way, there are certain expenses that exceed the liquid income of most people. Mm -hmm. Houses, cars, education is one of are three of those areas. So there may be the necessity of borrowing in those areas, but also where I was talking about the seven years, while seven-year terms may not be always practical today, the principle is clear that debt should be paid off as quickly as right. possible. Right, whittle it down. And so even if the term is, and, and here's a, a newsflash maybe for some viewers, that even if you have a seven-year loan, you in many cases can pay it off early. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with <laughs> there getting are ahead some of that please, curve. Some yeah. that will penalize, but in most cases, in fact, I would, if in any situation where I take out any kind of incur any kind of debt, I make sure I can pay it off without penalty. Mm. So, hey, if there's something that comes up where I'm able to pay it off earlier, I pay it off earlier. I mm. want to pay that thing off. So it doesn't actually change the price of the item you bought. That's <laughs> right. Now, the, another thing the lesson brings up a little bit later in the week is that uh, that of becoming co-signers for other people. In fact, it, go to Proverbs 6 and read verses 1 through 5 for us. Um, Bible, Bible Geek calls this usury uh, or... Um, Usury, I'm sorry, is debt. The Bible calls this um, making yourself surety for surety, somebody yeah. else. Uh, verses 1 through 6, Proverbs 6. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself. For you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and like a bird from the okay. hand of the fowler. So, the, I mean, this desperate yeah. fleeing from yeah. uh, being a cosigner. Um, you'll find this in a number of places in the Bible. Again, it calls it surety. But to become surety mm -hmm. for somebody else means I'm going to cosign. And when you, when you default on your loan, I'm the surety for it. I make sure it gets paid off. <laughs> yeah. And the lesson highlighted that, uh, where is it here? Yeah, it's interesting. You just said when you default on your loan. <laughs> Shouldn't it be an if? But, but <laughs> I, more, and I think what you're looking for is the lesson brought out. Uh, and, and 75%, yeah. it says, of co-signers end up making payments. So it's closer to an when you co default, yeah. not if you. You have to understand that if you become a co-signer, you are obligated to pay that whole amount mm -hmm. if somebody defaults. And in 75% of cases, statistically, people default on those payments. So... Mm. Um, now, the lesson, I, I, I wasn't getting it clearly about the cases. I, I put in our notes that there may be instances where parents must co-sign. First of all, I won't co-sign for anybody in a loan. Mm. But I have co-signed for my children because they have to build credit up. But I would say this. The Bible is very clear about fleeing from mm -hmm. making yourself surety, again, because you're going to carry that debt mm -hmm. when somebody else defaults. And so in any case, the case of my children, where I have co-signed, I have to be prepared to pay that whole debt going into it. Mm. I can't be surprised if they default. And of course, so that's, I'm not expecting them to and what have you. can be disappointed, you, but, but you can't, you have to have that but mindset. But that was my, my takeaway. I said there may be instances where, where parents must co-sign for children to help them build credit. In any case of co-signing, the one doing the co-signing must be prepared to accept full responsibility of the debt. That's the reality. And so there are some cases of necessary debt, but... Um, in principle, Shun debt, get it like out of there. leprosy, where you can avoid it, don't go into debt. Wait, save up money, what have you. Amen. And then takes us to our third talking point. Now, maybe you're, you know, viewing this and you're thinking, man, I wish I had known some of this stuff before I got into all my debt. And there are people who get themselves in a situation in debt. I was telling Cameron during mm. our, our pre-discussion, I, I knew a guy uh, I used to work with, started dating a girl, 
who had forty thousand dollars in credit card debt mm. alone, and then there was college debt and what have you. And sometimes people just get so like, how am I ever going to get out of this? But talking point number three, you can be free from debt. I like Psalm. 50, uh, the lesson used this in a different context, but I saw that it worked well. I felt that it worked well here. Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. And we'll see who gets it first. It's not a race or a competition, but, you know, I'm, but there. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, go ahead and read that, 14 and 15. 14 and 50. 15, I'm yes. sorry. It says, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Now that, that makes me think of Matthew, Matthew 6.33. You know, pay your vows to the Most High, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver. If God is giving, talking in this negative way about debt and co-signing, what have you, then he's certainly going to help out the person who wants to get out of debt. And so mm. the lesson gave some real practical examples, three steps, in fact, on uh, Tuesday's lesson. Number one, declare a moratorium on debt. A moratorium means you're putting it to death. Kill you're, it. you're killing it. You're not going to... No I'm taking new no, debt. No new debt. You know, make that decision, determine that I'm not going to do that, step number one. Step number two, make a covenant with God to pay off your debt. Say, Lord, you know I've gotten myself into this situation. Please forgive me. I want to go forward. I want to get out of this. I can't do it by myself. I need you to... Hmm. And the Lord will certainly He'll help you that, get yeah. out of that situation, but you've got to take the necessary steps. I mean, you can't just keep on going on and borrowing so that you declare the moratorium, make that covenant with God, number two. And step number three, begin paying off your debt, starting with the smaller ones first and working to the successively larger ones, which I thought was great. Sometimes we think, well, I'm going to deal with a big debt first, but then you'll, let's say I have 10 different debts that I'm paying off. And that big one is just, what's going to happen is if I focus on the smaller debt, maybe I owe somebody 50 bucks, I pay that off, now I only have nine. And I can take that 50, that whatever I was putting toward that, and put toward the next one. And if I go to the smaller ones, I can begin to reduce the mm -hmm. number of debts that I have. Uh, it's kind of a self-consolidation. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it will help keep you on track. And well, also it's psychologically the amounts encouraging, too. And, you ever get yes. to check off something on a list? It's very That's rewarding. Exactly right. <laughs> Especially when it comes to debt. Yeah. And so, and then Friday's lesson gives just a few more tips, like establishing a budget, destroying credit cards, and figure this one, uh, cutting back on spending. No, th that's not what they said. <laughs> the lesson says, begin economic measures, right. which you, is code for stop spending. That's exactly right. <laughs> and so Thursday's lesson, last paragraph, can you read that for us? And it gives this, uh, I think, a good <clears throat> summary here. Yeah, it says, by following biblical financial principles in our everyday lives, we can go a long way toward avoiding unnecessary debt and the terrible strain it can put on us and our families. And not just avoiding unnecessary debt, but getting out of debt when we find ourselves in that situation. The Lord will be faithful to you when you choose to be faithful to him um, with your finances and with everything else. Uh, could you read for us also Friday? Friday had a great quote. It's the first quote there you find on Friday from uh, from. Ellen White. Council on Stewardship yes. 257, I believe. It says, be determined never to incur another debt. Deny yourself a thousand things rather than run in debt. This has been the curse of your life, getting into debt. Obviously, this is written to a specific yes. person. Mm -hmm. So, um, But she goes on to say, avoid and it. And of us may relate to that. <laughs> Maybe. Avoid it, that is debt, mm -hmm. as you would the smallpox. <laughs> Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessing you will pay your debts and then owe no man anything if you live on porridge and bread. Do not falter, be discouraged, or turn back. Deny your taste. Deny the indulgence of appetite. Save your pence and pay your debts. Work them off as fast as possible. When you can stand forth a free man again, owing no man anything, you will have achieved a great victory. Mm, amen. A lot of lessons, and I'm sure good discussions in our Sabbath School mm -hmm. classes this week. But let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these important principles and such practical uh, applications in our lives. Please help us to live in contentment and free of debt so that we owe nothing to anyone except to owe you for our life and salvation and through you a debt of love and ministry to the rest of the world. Please, Lord, give us that that spirit of Christ in every aspect of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.